Quick question. And we're live, Lou. Good morning, and welcome to another episode of CNL Live Events. I'm Lou Riccoboni, your Master of Ceremonies. Today's session is being brought to you in partnership with the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, or Nuclear Industries, pardon me, OCNI. First, a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our host, OCNI's President and CEO, Dr. Ron Oberth. Should you encounter IT issues, please log out and then back in. And this session is being recorded and a link will be sent to all registrants. At the end of today's sessions, we're reserving some time for questions. Please use the chat function to submit your question and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Lastly, if you have any issues or additional questions, please feel free to submit them to communications at cnl.ca. With that, welcome, and I now turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Lou, uh, and welcome to our more than 300 guests this morning, and uh, a special congratulations to all those Italian friends on the line today. Uh, we have a lot of Italians in Toronto who celebrated quite robustly yesterday, so I'm sure some of you on the line this morning uh, are still smiling after that outcome yesterday, and I'm sad for my UK friends. Um, thanks, you. Uh, uh, in particular, Phil Compass for uh, playing a key role in organizing today's session, uh, and Lou Riccobino, of course, uh, uh, works with us to make these things happen and help us put on excellent events to help our suppliers understand uh, the great work that's going on at CNL and how they can, as partners, uh, participate in that work. So we have two, uh, two presentations today. Uh, one by uh, Kristen Schroeder, uh, who is the General Manager and Deputy Vice President Environmental Remediation Management at CNL. Uh, Kristen will tell us about some of the major programs that his group will be undertaking at CNL uh, and neighboring sites over the next number of years. And then we have uh, Phil Caldwell, uh, the Commercial Director of CNL, who will talk about the procurement strategies that CNL intends to use in engaging partners to work with them on these important programs. Uh, so let's start with, uh, with an overview of, of some of the work that's gonna be coming up at CNL and uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Kristen Schroeder. Thanks, Ron. 
no, really happy to be here today and really appreciate uh, everyone participating in, in today's event. Uh, so as uh, Ron pointed out, I, I'm going to start off by talking about some of our major projects and then I'm going to uh, tag team with Phil Caldwell, our general manager for uh, business services, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, supply chain and how we can engage with the, how we're going to engage with supply chain going forward. So can we move to the next slide, please. Yeah, we'll just jump to the next one. Um, so I, I'm going to jump through. Uh, these first couple slides fairly quickly. Uh, this is just a reminder about CNL's laboratories and, and the project sites where we're working. Uh, you know, so our main campus is the Chalk River Laboratories. Uh, we also have the Whiteshell Laboratories, which I'm going to talk about the Historic Waste Program. I'm not going to talk today about our National Innovation Center for Cybersecurity in Brunswick, but I will be talking about our prototype reactors and some of the legacy facilities that we're managing. So, can go to the next slide, please. So, first off, uh, CNL. Uh, most of our audience would be aware of our history uh, and uh, you know what we do. Uh, so we're uh, Canada's National Nuclear Laboratory. Um, you know we've been in operation uh, at the Chalk River Laboratory since the uh, late 40s. Um, you know this background here is the Chalk River site, and this is uh, you know where we do the majority of our research now. Uh, we have you know a large campus here, which we're revitalizing, and we're going to talk a little bit about that revitalization, what the focus of that. Uh, but we have a broad portfolio where we're looking at R&D. This is the birthplace of uh, nuclear in Canada. And what we're going to talk a little bit about today is, you know, also going to be uh, is kind of the birthplace for our environment mediation work and our decommissioning work in Canada. We are, you know, probably the, not probably, we are the area doing the ma majority of uh, decommissioning and um, environment mediation in Canada at our, at our sites. And we're really helping to, uh, to kickstart that work in Canada. Uh, OPG and, and Jean C2, Hydro Quebec will be coming in the future. So it's a great opportunity for us to work with supply chains to build up those capabilities uh, within the Canadian nuclear industry. Next slide, please. Um, and really, that's this slide is really just talking about the opportunities there are for the supply chain. So I'm going to focus largely on environmental remediation management slides, but the the next slide we'll just talk to you about some of the infrastructure work that's happening in our Chalk River as part of our, our revitalization work. So as uh, I suspect most people are aware, uh, when we launched the uh, GOCO, the government owned company operated model back in 2015, the government announced a 1.2 billion investment that they put into the Chalk River campus. So we've been working um, feverishly for the last uh, you know, six years in building new buildings and revitalizing the site. You can see some of the new buildings that we put, have put in place, hydrogen research, material science, um, we have a new site entrance building, a new support facility, uh, currently focusing on a co collaboration hub and uh, really looking forward to our advanced nuclear material research center, which is coming uh, later in the 2020s. Uh, but a lot of work has been done with the supply chain in support of revitalizing our site. Uh, as I said, it was built up in the 40s, so we had a lot of facilities that passed their service, uh, service life, and now we're looking to clean up that site, bring it more into a campus field at our chakra laboratories. Next slide, please. So focusing more on the environmental remediation management uh, projects, uh, I'm going to start at the Chalk River site, and uh, the first project is going to be the near surface disposal facility. And I do hope you have heard about this facility. Uh, this is a key project uh, for CNL and really is going to uh, kickstart a lot of our um, major decommissioning and environmental remediation work. Um, the near first surface disposal facility is a low level uh, waste disposal facility that we're proposing. So it has not been built yet. We're proposing to build uh, to hold up to a million cubic meters of low level nuclear waste from our Chalk River site, as well as uh, some of our other uh, CNL uh, locations. The majority of it, approximately 95 percent of that is coming from Chalk River is already either here generated uh, in storage or you know needs to be uh, dug up as part of our mediation or as part of our ongoing operations and decommissioning work. Uh, this project here, we are in the environmental assessment phase. Just last week, um, we received uh, confirmation from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission that our final environmental impact statement has been accepted um, to move forward uh, from an environmental st uh, assessment standpoint, as well as our licensing package. So we're looking to have uh, commission uh, 
CNC Commission hearing dates scheduled uh, by the end of the month. Uh, we we're, we're hoping here uh, Commission hearing dates and we're looking at early in 2022 to have the first Commission hearing uh, for the near surface disposal facility. It's going to be a two part hearing process. And essentially what that means is the first part will focus on the technical and the second part will focus on engagement with the uh, public and indigenous communities. So it, it's it's a vital project for us and we really do want to encourage everyone uh, to get involved as part of this hearing process to learn more and to share your support or or raise any concerns that you have to uh, to ensure that we get that addressed as part of our licensing process. So this is a key project for us to move forward with. Uh, if we are successful in our hearing package, it's uh, about a three year process to get the facility built um, and into operation. Next slide, please. Um, with the, uh, you know, pending the outcome of the NSDF near surface disposal facility, that will really help to push forward more uh, demolition and decommissioning work happening at Chalk River. However, we still have been moving forward uh, with a significant amount of, of decommissioning work. And I'm going to start on the far right and work my way to the left. So on the far right, we have uh, is building 440 is internally we know it, but this is our emergency uh, process water cooling building. This building will be the 100th, uh, 100 uh, building to be demolished uh, since the GOCO came in in 2015. Uh, so this is one of our oldest buildings on site. It was built up in uh, 1945. And it just goes to show the amount of work that's been happening at our Chalk River site in order to revitalize that campus that we were talking about, deal with our legacy liabilities um, and continue to, to deal with it as we go forward. So we're really excited um, that work should be starting this week, uh, the demolition work, uh, and by the end of the summer that building will be down and we'll take credit for 100th building uh, demolished on the Chucker site. The middle building, uh, you know, I'm, I'm flagging this one. This is our building 250. It's a chemistry building. It's a large uh, six story uh, complex that has um, you know, a treating facility, hot cells, uh, test loops. It is a very complex building that we've been working on for the last year. Uh, we've been focused heav heavily on reducing the uh, inventory, radiological inventory in the building. To date, we've removed 20%. Uh, essentially, we've dealt with the uh, treating facility and we're moving on um, now to the hot cells. So we, we anticipate to have 60% of the radiological inventory removed by the end of this year and the building plan to be uh, completed by uh, 2025, uh, that, that facility. And then the one on the left just sort of shows some additional work that we're doing. Um, you know, so this is a picture of uh, our excavator taking down the, the base of our NRX uh, cooling water delay tanks uh, that we finished up uh, early this spring. We had some other buildings that we did, um, you know, non-nuclear buildings, our former sewage, sewage treatment plant was removed as well as uh, we're into system removal in a number of our buildings. So the key thing I wanted to uh, flag here is uh, a lot of work has been going on at the Chalk River site on the decommissioning, and we're gonna be looking to increase the support that we get from the supply chain in this area. Um, one of the key uh, contracts that's uh, recently gone out is minor construction uh, master service agreement that you'll hear Phil talk a little bit about. We have uh, some design support we've been putting in place, and you're gonna hear Phil talk a little bit more about our decommissioning toolbox uh, toolkit that uh, we're looking to put in place uh, to engage multiple areas in the supply chain to help us augment staff, to help us augment some of our capabilities and to bring in some expertise in some areas where we're looking for some additional support. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a bunch of new builds uh, similar to what you would have seen in our infrastructure, but these are really focused on the uh, environmental remediation management side. So this is a snapshot of three facilities. Um, the first one is the CAS facility. So this will be a centralized, flexible area uh, for cask and flask loading operations, uh, maintenance in that. So we have significant amount of cask movements, uh, shipments that we need to make on site as well as off site when we're um, shutting down or closing down the white shell laboratories, we're removing fuel from white shell to Chalk River when we're moving some of the intermediate level waste that needs to be um, stored at Chalk River when the white shell uh, as part of the white shell decommissioning 
uh, movements from of material from Douglas Point and Jean C1 uh, to Chalk River for centralized storage. All of this, um, you know, we do need to ensure that it meets uh, the transportation guidelines and regulations. And uh, a lot of these do need specialized containment, uh, referred to as cask and flasks. And we uh, we're building a facility in order to maintain these on site. Uh, so this uh, will be going out through the supply chain through our major constructions uh, MSA that you hear Phil talk a little bit about. And construction timeline is kind of the 23 to 24 time frame. The middle one is our uh, intermediate level waste. That's what ILW stands for, uh, storage facility. Uh, so although we are putting forward a solution for low level waste, uh, we do not have a solution in Canada for disposal of intermediate level waste. Uh, so we are building a, uh, a long term storage facility to uh, enable our, our cleanup activities to continue while we, uh, we move forward with uh, plans for some sort of disposal facility for intermediate level waste in, in the future. So this will be a, a steel building that will be reinforced with uh, concrete walls for shielding uh, and for storage of above above ground storage of shielded containers for intermediate level waste. Again, this is something that we're looking to put out through our um, major um, construction uh, master service agreement and the uh, construction timelines are very similar to the CAS facility in a 2324 timeframe. The one on the right is the, that's our heavy water detrudiation facility, HWDF, um, and this is really to move uh, sort of a house or a, our detrudiation technology. Uh, we do have about, as it says on there, about 600,000 liters of treated heavy water that we need to uh, manage. So we have the capability we've designed, we've done the research in house and, and put into uh, play uh, a detrudiation technology. So we're building a new facility in order to detrudiate our inventory of heavy water to bring that down to a virgin heavy water such that it can be uh, used in the non-nuclear industry. So uh, time frame for this, similar to the other uh, facilities, um, component assembly will start in 2023 and uh, construction will be in the 24 to 2026 time frame. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other, the other area, key area at Chalk River that's uh, going on. So we have the, uh, the demolition, we've got the new fuel projects, but we have waste. Uh, so this is managing our current inventory of waste as well as our future inventory of waste. And uh, when I spoke about the uh, intermediate level waste uh, new storage facility, we do want to build up um, a supply chain in Canada to get some radioactive waste containers to store both our intermediate level waste uh, as well as potentially some uh, low level waste. So we will be uh, engaging with the supply chain in order to procure these uh, so that we have that uh, supply of material of containers for us to use. This next one is a multi purpose uh, waste facility. So we do have uh, a need in the short term while we're getting, uh, you know, getting through going through the approval process for the near surface disposal facility as well as uh, this new ILW storage facility. Uh, to build some multi-purpose facilities in order to help process waste, in order to ensure that we have compliant waste uh, forms to put into the near surface disposal facility and can get some waste into the ILW storage facility. So we are putting uh, some multi-purpose uh, facilities in place uh, this year. Again, going through the, um, I think this is either the minor or the major construction MSA in order to move that forward. Uh, we have a number of upgrades that we need to do in, to our facilities in order to support our activities. This picture is our waste treatment center where we need to get um, both some solid and uh, liquid waste uh, capabilities built into this, uh, managing that. So this is something that uh, we'll be utilizing, um, whether that be the decommissioning toolbox kit or our master service agreement in order to help us with that. And the final picture has to uh, shows us kind of a soils uh, managing some of our soils, but uh, concrete and spoils, uh, soils, spoils management is, uh, is an important aspect. We do want to manage this um, waste form and we are building a uh, concrete crushing plant uh, currently right now uh, to reuse um, concrete rather than sending it to the local landfill. And uh, we use this for roadbed material on site and it just helps us to uh, minimize the amount of waste going to our own landfill as well as to the uh, local landfills. You go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our reactors and our decommissioning horizons. So I'll, I'll start with the ones at the Chalk River site first. NRU uh, operated until 2018. 
it is currently in the final throes of safe shutdown um, and we're moving into our hazard reduction phase. So with this facility here, we're not planning to go into a long, uh, you know, 30 years of uh, storage with surveillance similar to what we've done at some of the other reactors that you see on this uh, slide. Uh, as we're uh, finalizing our safe shutdown, we're moving straight into uh, hazard reduction and decommissioning planning. So there'll be some opportunities there as we move forward uh, to engage with the supply chain. NRX is the next picture. Uh, we already have uh, decommissioning to start um, work in this facility with for the first phase, which is really everything outside of the Calandria. So work is underway right now. Um, this, uh, you know, for the next uh, five to eight years, we'll be uh, prepping uh, the NRX, removing redundant systems that aren't required and starting the characterization of the Calandria so that we can start um, with the Calandria in the second phase. So kind of work that we're looking to support from the supply chain here, design work, there will be some uh, minor construction support. And again, the decommissioning toolbox will be utilizing that to support NRX. Uh, WR1 and NPD. So the WR1 is White Shell Reactor 1. That's at the White Shell Laboratories. And the NPD, the nuclear power demonstration, is just up the road from Chalk River. Both of these are in the environmental assessment phase. They're both pretty much at the same spot as we uh, we work through that. Uh, NPD, we're looking to submit the revised EIS uh, to the regulator responding uh, to the Federal Provincial Review Team's comments uh, later this summer. Uh, and for WR1, uh, that will be uh, this fall. So both of these, uh, we, we expect that through most of 2022, we'll be looking to resolve comments uh, from uh, our regulators and uh, into licensing a commission hearing, uh, assuming we resolve all those comments in the 2023 timeframe. And then uh, if we are successful, work would start late 2023 uh, in both of those uh, projects. Um, the second to last, Douglas Point. Uh, so just last year, uh, we went through our decommissioning hearing and, and we heard earlier this year that we did get approval. So work has commenced there on our decommissioning activities. We, um, we have uh, a significant amount of work uh, happening at the Douglas Point over the next five years. Um, we are putting a new electrical system. It seems kind of odd to put a new electrical system in as you're decommissioning, but this is really to isolate the existing uh, class four power and put new electrical, temporary electrical in so that we know for sure uh, what the live services are in the building. So that work is undergoing right now. We have some resin tanks to remove. Uh, we're, we're removing all of our non-nuclear buildings, our turbine building, administration building. Um, and into their purification building. Uh, fuel, um, we are con continue, continue to keep our fuel here um, until there's a decision on the NWMO to decide whether or not it's going to be shifted uh, to Chalk River or if we'll leave it here. Uh, but work through the supply chain is going to be on design to support us on these activities, designated substance removal, demolition work, and building modifications uh, to support decommissioning going forward. And the last one, uh, Jean C1, it's on in Quebec. It's a shared site with Hydro Quebec for the Jean C2 site. Uh, this one is not. Um, we do not have a decommissioning license for it. We're uh, into. We're doing hazard reduction uh, and, and maintaining this facility in storage with surveillance. But there is still a fair amount of work that's going on here. Uh, again, we have some resin tanks that we, we previously emptied that we need to remove. We uh, we have more uh, designated substance abatement. We're going to start to strip out the turbine building. Uh, the turbine is still there, uh, so there'll be some work there. So the type of contracts that we're going to be doing, again, similar to uh, Douglas Point design work, designated substance removal, building modifications and enabling systems, uh, and some decommissioning, uh, decontamination, sorry, demolitions work. So again, all of these reactors will be making use of that decommissioning toolbox kit uh, that Phil is going to tell you a little bit more on uh, his in his part. Can we move to the next slide, please? So I'm going to shift away now from the uh, Chalk River uh, and talk about our historic waste program, uh, also referred to as the Port Hope Area Initiative. So um, you see the top picture of the Port Hope Harbor. Uh, we are currently into um, mechanical dredging of the, uh, the harbor as part of the cleanup. And down below is our small scale sites. Um, you know, so through our historical waste our historic waste program, CNL is delivering on the Government of Canada's commitment to restore the lands that have been impacted from past practices of the nuclear industry. Um, these undertakings include Canada's largest environmental cleanup 
Uh, this is a $1.4 billion uh, cleanup that's been underway for a number of years. It still has a number of years to go. Um, and we're also supporting the uh, Northern Transportation Route, which I'll talk to you in a, just in a moment. Uh, so this uh, project continues to generate uh, business opportunities for local and regional supply chain. The uh, Port Hope Area Initiative, as, as shown in this slide, is, is broken down to various projects, including construction and operation of the engineered long-term waste management facility, uh, testing, remediation, and restoration of more than 1,000 property, private uh, residential properties in Port Hope. That's kind of that small scale sites. And the cleanup of industrial waste has also been generated from the industry in the previous century. So uh, part of this cleanup is not only uh, radioactive um, contaminants, but it's also chemi chemical contaminants as well. So this work, uh, this, is a, this is really a massive undertaking that we're doing here. And it requires a variety of suppliers and services from engineering and design, to heavy construction, support services such as security, maintenance, vehicle repair, um, a lot of uh, a lot of supply chain support on this one. Can we move to the next slide, please. Um, Port Granby. Uh, this top picture is our engineered mount at Port Granby. We're in the final stages of capping uh, the Port Granby uh, mount, but uh, the bottom talks about the uh, the Northern Transportation Route. Uh, so the cleanup of the Northern T Transportation Route will enable legacy liabilities to be addressed and ensure that those lands meet criteria for future unrestricted use. CNL has received funding uh, commitment from AC on behalf of the Government of Canada to undertake and complete the cleanup of the Northern Transportation route, uh, route sites. And as part of this ongoing process, we're engaging with Indigenous communities uh, and organizations, stakeholders and the public on the cleanup plans. Our work uh, to ensure business opportunities are available to Indigenous communities, uh, businesses and suppliers throughout uh, through our contracting process. So we're committed uh, to identifying opportunities to support and develop training programs for our local Indigenous communities, particularly in, in uh, this area uh, of the Northern Transportation Route. Can we move to the next slide, please? Before I pass it over to Phil, I'm going to talk to you about one other site, and that's the uh, White Shell Closure um, Project. So this is the uh, White Shell Laboratories shown here in the picture at uh, in Manitoba. Um, so this site has been shut down uh, for a while, since uh, 2001. A lot of great work uh, has gone on already, and uh, we're moving forward. And this kind of gives you an idea of the scope um, that we're doing here. So we have, you know, over 43 buildings that need to be uh, decommissioned and, and demolished at this site. We're already about halfway through that. Uh, we need to do all of the scoping characterization for underground services. We have waste areas that need to be dealt with, and we do need to, I spoke a little bit about the white shell reactor number one. Uh, that is a prominent uh, structure on this site that we're proposing in situ disposal for, uh, similar to the NPD site. If we just go to the next slide, I've got a few pictures to show progress to date. Uh, first one on the left, um, you know, this is the uh, predator, predator manipulator uh, being built. This is in support of our white uh, shielded bunkers uh, waste retrieval system. So as part of our cleanup of our waste management areas, there is a substantial amount of material that uh, we do need some remote, equip, uh, remote equipment in order to manipulate and package this material. So this is just you know, a picture of some of the equipment that's into uh, fabrication and testing that we'll be utilizing here. Um, the next one just sort of shows our progress on site. Uh, this is as part of our, our main campus demolition. We've taken down a number of key facilities already, our uh, building 300 R&D complex, uh, nu numerous uh, material handling buildings and our, our laundry facility. Um, in the back of it is, uh, you know, the, is, uh, we're just underway uh, of our building 200, which is our active liquid waste treatment center. So a lot of work has been done to uh, finish the demolition of our main campus there. Low level waste campaign. Uh, so we, we are cleaning up um, our waste management areas, packaging up waste uh, to be uh, NSDF compliant material that is being shipped to Chalk River. Uh, we've shipped approximately 5,400 cubic meters of radioactive waste already with zero incidents. So a lot of work has gone in to uh, start to get that material off the white shell site so we can properly close that site uh, and to chalk over for storage as we await approval for the NSDF. Final one there is just showing uh, we've been doing a lot of work in preparation for our fuel shipments. 
uh, doing some investigations and uh, verifications of our baskets and containment uh, for the fuel, getting ready for fuel shipments to start next year. So a lot of work happening with supply at White Shell uh, and a lot of opportunities with the supply chain uh, there as well. I think I'm going to the next slide and I think this is where I hand off to uh, Phil. Yes, there's a nice picture of Phil. Um, over to you, Phil. A very good morning to everybody. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Kristen. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the key things for, for me looking at uh, as we run through those slides is the, the variety of uh, of work that's uh, that's going on at CNL uh, now uh, and a long time into the future, which is, you know, from my perspective, going to cause a, you know, create a very kind of uh, vibrant supply chain for us. Now, just wanted to start off um, uh, a few weeks ago, as Lou was saying, as we kicked off today's meeting, you know, that we've got a series of these kind of events, and Les Anderson, our uh, new director of supply chain gave an overview of uh, you know, some of the direction of travel that we were continuing to, to go on, uh, particularly in regard to you know, moving towards some of our strategic delivery partnerships. As Kristen was saying, we're, we're using these uh, uh, fairly significantly in a number of areas, and I thought it was worthwhile just doing a little recap of, of what they, they're generally about just, just to start off with. Um, Essentially, you know, what we've been trying to do over the last few years is uh, is build a, a closer, more collaborative relationship with our supply chain, particularly in areas that we deem of either, you know, a risk to us or a strategic importance, which you can kind of see a little bit on the uh, on the slide in terms of, you know, the kind of hierarchy of where, where, where our supply chain sits. But there is some stuff that's absolutely vital to the work we do on a day to day basis. And that, that, that's really given birth to, to our thoughts about these, uh, these new strategic uh, delivery partnerships. And we have a number of those currently running in the marketplace at the moment, which I'm sure many of you are aware. We have the characterization, engineering, design, remediation, restoration at Port Hope. But, you know, that's also a contract that's CNL wide, but it, it was particularly designed for Port Hope. Uh, we've got a major construction, uh, which is geared for uh, delivering, you know, some of the larger construction projects, generally geared over uh, you know, $10 million in, in value each of the individual projects. And again, long range, uh, you know, long term relationship and contracts looking out towards, uh, you know, a 10 year kind of horizon with these contracts. Um, a little bit of a side sidebar bit to, to, to ERM as well, but we've also got things like energy performance retrofit contracts, which is also kind of sat in our partnership kind of ring and we'll also talk about the uh, decommissioning toolbox as well which is you know something really important to uh, to us moving forward in the uh, demolition and decommissioning world um i think when we're talking about these strategic partnerships um you know th there's a certain characteristic that we're, we're looking to to have with these which are as, as i said long term um, but importantly, they're, they help to build the capabilities. And we'll talk about sustainability in a, in a little while as well, which is really important to us. Um, but what I'd like to do, and if we could possibly move to the next slide, please, is just talk a, a very simple slide, just giving a little bit of a view of, uh, you know, how these strategic delivery partnerships work a little bit. Um, uh, the question is always raised, you know, I'm, I'm a smaller supplier, I'm a medium sized supplier, you know, because you're putting these large contracts in place, what does that mean for me? And I think I think the point we'd like to make is that, that there's a whole range of opportunities and, and the way we're going to continue engaging. So if we look at the slide, you know, we've got these big strategic delivery partnerships and they will have a significant amount of direct business into the supply chain themselves. So the relationship will very much be between them and the supply chain uh, in terms of the tier three and four contractors. Um, and indeed, you, you, you've seen some of the, uh, the work we'll have. You'll have the strategic delivery partners even work with some of our MSA suppliers as well. Our MSA suppliers, again, will have a range of uh, you know, materials and trades that they're going to be looking for. And there will be, if we look to the right hand side of the, the screen, um, 
you know, there's still a number of direct relationships that CNL uh, needs to maintain uh, directly with certain members of the supply chain. And that's not just big contractors, that's small contractors, small suppliers. It's a whole range of things that, you know, we need to have that closer relationship. Now, moving forward in terms of making sure that the visibility of opportunities there is, you know, what we're working towards now is uh, once we get our strategic delivery partners on board, you know, working with them to actually uh, understand what they're going to need from the marketplace. And we're going to use them as a conduit. And what we're going to try and do is take the opportunities where they're looking for suppliers to support them. And we're going to try and pipe those through into CNL's own vendor portal. So you'll see not only the direct opportunities with CNL, but you'll also see the opportunities arising from these larger suppliers that we've got and try and make that visible to everybody out there. So, so that, that's how we're going to try and make sure that uh, everybody can continue to see what's going on. Um, I think uh, I'd just like to touch on just very briefly uh, when we uh, did a bit of an update, I think back in uh, November last year, one of the big bits of feedback from from all of the supply chain, from every out there, which was really helpful and you know, thank you for it was, you know, we, we had kind of lost touch with our vendor portal a little bit in terms of what opportunities were there. Uh, and, you know, we did explain that from our planning side of things, uh, you know, COVID did send us into a little bit of a spin um, and it was difficult to project the timing of some of these uh, these potential procurements. We are hopefully trying to get uh, a better visibility of that moving forward now. Um, we have got some of those starting to come onto the vendor portal. So, so again, we are revigorating that, getting that up and hopefully future you know, we're going to bring our, our major suppliers into publishing their opportunities on there as well. So hopefully that should be uh, of, of good news to everybody. Next slide, please. So I just want to just give a little bit of context here um, uh, about, you know, the magnitude of the supply chain uh, interactions we're looking at. Now, for CNL, particularly in decommissioning, you know, we do a lot of self self perform ourselves and you know, we are, we are looking and building our own capabilities in the decommissioning area. Having said that, though, there's there's still a vast amount of support that we continue to, to have from the industry in terms of uh, materials, particularly construction activities. Uh, and this slide here is just to give a little bit of uh, an idea of the spend that's going forward through to 2030. Uh, and so you're aware it goes w way beyond that as well. But if you look at some of the peaks of our spend, you know, we're probably close to, you know, half a billion dollars in the supply chain at kind of our higher levels of spend. So, so it's a fairly significant kind of con contribution that kind of matches anything in the industry at the moment in terms of, uh, you know, what's going on out there. So, and as, as I said earlier, vast kind of uh, array of different uh, bits of support we're going to need going forwards. Okay, next slide, please. OK, so two, two, two of the project, two, two of the you know, agreements that we're just finishing up um, you know, at the moment, uh, minor construction. We're in the process of just uh, uh, finalising the, the awards of those. So that one's something we want to get uh, in use for, for, this, uh, for this construction season. Um, we, we've got, uh, uh, we've, we've got a, a number of projects lined up, which you can see on the left hand side already for that. Uh, as well as a, a number of kind of smaller uh, projects that uh, the site needs on a day-to-day -day basis from bits of pavings, uh, repair, but it's also there to support, you know, it's not only a construction agreement, but it's there to support decommissioning as well. So, so that one serves both and it's very much around uh, uh, our, our more of our day-to-day -day support. Uh, our, our, you know, I wouldn't say less significant or just our smaller, smaller projects that we're running from the construction side of things. Uh, and that that's up and running very, very soon indeed. Uh, our major construction one has just been through its pre-qualification and we're, we're into uh, uh, kicking off the RFP side of things now. Um, I have to say and a very big thank you to to all the supply chain out there. We've we've had fantastic responses to uh, to see the to minor construction and major construction. Um, really excited about some of the uh, teaming that we're seeing out there in the industry. Uh, some of the really uh, kind of innovative uh, thinking of, and partnerships 
So not only are we looking to partner, but we can see some great work going on in the supply chain about uh, you know various other kind of consortia coming together to work out how they can bring solutions to us. So I need to say a very big thank you for all the hard work that's going into that. From a major construction, uh, once that's in place, and Kristen talked uh, through a few of those, um, you know, it will be geared at all of our major kind of construction efforts over $10 million, um, which do include the ones we've kind of got on the right hand side of the screen here, but it will also include, you know, again, anything else of a more significant level moving out to the future uh, as, as we continue to progress through our plans. So again, significant kind of spend in, in construction area. And I think I think the key thing for us in, in, in the construction world here is which we're kind of really wanting to kind of uh, build upon is, you know, we realise there's, you know, limitations in supply um, and, and that's why, the, you know, the bringing together the consortia in terms of bringing that capability locally to us is so vitally important. OK, next slide, please. So, um, Kristen talked about it a number of times this morning, um, uh, and th this one is a, a slightly different one to to how we, I think we view our, our, our construction kind of delivery partnerships outside of things. In in the decommissioning world, you know, we do want to have and will have a number of very close relationships with with a number of firms moving forward. Um, but it's very clear to us that there is no one small or large individual company out there that has all the answers to, to, to decommissioning and demolition. Um, and and as, as I was mentioning earlier, we do we do a great deal of this ourselves. What we do, however, require is, you know, support in a, a range of different services uh, and, and tools that we need to help get that job done. And it ranges equipment, services, consumables. Uh, and what we've been doing is looking at everything we think we need looking forward to that 20, 29, 30 kind of uh, horizon at the moment and, and even beyond. Uh, and what we've recognised that over the last few years, we've built a great deal of capability. We have something in the order of 100 master agreements today. Um, but we can also see when we look at that closely and look at some of the challenges that face us, uh, that there are a number of areas where we've got gaps today. Uh, and the uh, the slide on on in the middle in the yellow gives a few of the areas where we're, we're definitely going to need some support. So so there is bits of uh, uh, decommissioning and demolition training at kind of trade and working level. There's bits of support in planning, so cost estimating, modelling, risk. Um, uh, you know, a big one for the industry now is uh, you know digital twin mapping. You know, creating that. Sort of, you know, virtual reality of, of the challenges so so we can plan how we uh, we tackle some of the problems in the most efficient way possible. Uh, lab equipment, lots of characterization. Um, you know, we, we, we have lab services where we we buy out uh, our, our services and get tests done, but there's also a great deal that we do internally and, and that also supports us not only in uh, environmental remediation space, but that also helps out our, our science and technology side of things. Um, we have field equipment um, and that ranges from uh, air monitoring, ICAMs, uh, various bits of testing equipment that we might need in the field for, for safe activities. So again, there's a, there's a fairly large catalogue of, of things there. Um, communication, heavy equipment. Um, you know, moving forward, there's a, you know, with some of the facilities, some of the significant constru construction work, and uh, you know, looking towards uh, the near surface disposal facility uh, being in operation again, uh, you know, a quite a lot of heavy equipment that comes into play for us. Um, as we start to tackle the challenges of uh, the uh, more challenging radiologically, you know, we will be looking to. There's two lines here, you know, remote handling and robotics. Uh, and looking at the slides earlier of the standpipes and bunker system, that that was just a, a little illustration of you know some of the, the retrievals kind of processing and, and uh, um, technology that we're going to need to help support some of those some of those challenges, um, and that includes you know, uh, you know rocks and various other bits of equipment where we we're going to need to to get in there and be able to safe, safely work. Uh, Kristen also talked about, uh, and this is an interesting for sort of waste packaging and storage solutions. So this is everything from, 
you know, large containers to drums, uh, to bags, totes. Um, again, these are kind of things that we pretty much want to have on an inventory basis and to be able to call off. Uh, and, and much of the talk is about having off the shelf capabilities to give Kristen and the team the ability to deliver what they need to do on a day to day basis. In terms of pursuing, uh, you know, most of these uh, these types of work, you know, that as as the little blue blocks have got there, there's three kind of key areas here. We've got products and service catalogs where we definitely do want to have, you know, literally a catalog to, to access um, that there, there will be, you know, through the, the master agreements and, and through these major delivery partnerships, they'll kind of classify those as our preferred suppliers. And we will also need a number of one off particular engagements where the nature of what we're buying is very kind of particular to what we, we need to do. So, so we're going to continue kind of pushing that. Um, the slide on the right uh, for anyone that's been looking in there, there's a number of the, the, the really kind of uh, what we kind of say quick wins, things that we're, we're looking to, to kind of progress this year. Uh, and this will be a progressive kind of uh, development of this toolkit over a number of years. And what we're trying to do is prioritise what's important to us this year. So, so that includes for us, um, you know, one of the things we will be running this year actually is because we have got so many more projects running, we are going to be running um, and it's something we've kind of talked about for a while, but it is something we're going to do this year with a whole project management support agreement. So a long term one for for a range of project management support, cost estimating, you know, construction management, project management uh, uh, to give us ourselves to support the support in the projects area. Uh, the digital twin side we're trying to moving forward uh, with at the moment uh, and certainly ILW containers. So, so there's some of the things that they're, they're really kind of moving quite quickly on today. OK, next slide, please. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier, sustainability, uh, and, and we've shown this slide uh, on a couple of uh, occasions, but I just want to uh, bring this back to bear as well as one other kind of important thing to consider for the decommissioning tool toolkit as well. So for us, sustainability is really, really important for as a company. Uh, and I think as, 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 a, as a country in Canada, it's important for us. Uh, and all the things you see, you see on this slide in terms of, you know, sustainable green procurement, biodiversity, climate resilience, um, diversity inclusion, you know, the, these are things that should be important to all of us as companies. And, uh, you know, we're very much pushing that. There are two two things I really do need to kind of draw out of the, our whole sustainability agenda. And, and, and you know, please be aware as we're running our kind of procurements in the future, these will be scoring modifiers in terms of, you know, selecting successful uh, businesses to work with us. So, uh, you know, please, please do think about how this, how, how you bring, you know, these things to bear for us. But two big ones is building our local economy. So, as I was saying earlier, the big thing that we're trying to do is, is make sure that we've got the capability to deliver the extent of all of this work. Uh, and I'd say, you know, where we are at the moment, one of the reasons for some of these procurements is recognising that we are pushing the boundaries of that capabilities at certain points in time. So we're very much wanting to bring uh, engagement in. You know, we're really, really keen to see organisations that, uh, you know, are willing to, to set up shop uh, locally in, in our uh, geographic area and support businesses. In fact, just with our minor construction, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of our preferred proponents there, which we're just in the process of running through at the moment, you know, brought that exact kind of component to us uh, in terms of setting up shop with a very, very strong consortia. So we're, we're delighted to see that, want to see more of it uh, and see what we can uh, bring to, to build the local community. The second one is our indigenous engagement. It's, it's, it's always been important to us. As you can see from the slides Kristen has shown on things like the Northern Transport Route, you know, that, that you know, it's, it's a vital element to, to, to projects like that. But I would say it's that, that's CNL wide. That's not just uh, limited to uh, places like the Northern Transport Route. You know, we want to see, you know, the, the diversity brought to all of our procurements. Uh, whether it's uh, you know indigenous, small, medium, local businesses, um, very very keen to see the, how that all comes together in our procurements. The last point, which isn't a sustainability one, but it's it's one that um, I think is worthwhile just mentioning quickly as we talk about the toolkit a little bit. 
and that's one about uh, you know QA requirements uh, in in nuclear decommissioning. Um, from from April this year, as a site, you know, in terms of doing nuclear bits of work, some of our QA standards have brought us up to needing to operate under N299. Uh, we we recognise that for certain construction companies and designers, uh, not everybody is is carrying all of the credentials for that at the moment. Um, so you know what I'd like to say is um, it's something that uh, please be aware of if you're wanting to participate in nuclear construction side of things, uh, and it's also something that we're working with the, the businesses that we you know we are working with and running procurements with in terms of just working out how we can get ourselves up to those kind of necessary standards when the projects necessitate them. Now, clearly, when they don't, then we won't. We're not going to push that, and it's uh, obviously only when it's needed. But it's it's going to be a key component for us moving forwards. Next slide, please. OK, I just wanted to just touch on a, with a, a little bit of a, a business side of things in terms of the approach. Um, one of the things that's also going to be happening as we, as we move forward as well is, you know, we're wanting to to get a, a good handle on the performance of our projects and our contracts. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of time internally uh, kind of revamping our own performance management systems internally in terms of cost estimating, uh, you know, cost management, risk management, uh, planning resources. Uh, and the slide there is a little bit of our kind of systems based architecture that we've got in terms of what supports us, including fairly recently moving to a Primavera P6 uh, kind of cloud based environment. Now, what that does is it gives us an, a, you know, an opportunity for a number of things to synchronize your performance management that our supply chain do with with ourselves. So, you know, we kind of link the tools a little bit together. So so we will be pushing, uh, you know, where we can bring that about. We are looking to standardize a few of those project controls requirements. So we've got consistency of how things th flow through to us. Again, we're going to deal with this on a proportional map. Uh, you know, matter, you know, doing something like the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Centre or doing something like NSDF, you know, pretty much follow pretty much what we're doing, uh, you know, ourselves. Uh, you know, we don't expect that for doing, you know, 50 Ks worth of uh, small paving. So it's a proportional approach, but we are looking for closer alignment of, you know, project controls and reporting systems. So so we all know where we stand uh, and we're in a place to be able to respond to, you know, positive and negative kind of performance as, as these projects progress. OK, and next slide, please. So just 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 a quick bit in terms of uh, just just going back to just finishing up with some of the timing of, of some of these big agreements when they come to fruition. Um, as we saw earlier in the, uh, the slide with some of the values on significant spend again, timing wise here, a number of things, the, these kind of being run through now and you know for these big agreements certainly but into uh, 2022 um you know having them ready for for next season uh and really hit the uh, hit hit the ground running so on that note um i'm going to call it a day and uh, and hand back to our master of ceremonies and just say thank you very much everybody for for your support and joining in this morning Uh, thanks, Phil and, uh, and Kristen. That was an excellent overview. Uh, and uh, the, a number of questions have come in, but I'm going to start with um, sort of a comment, and I guess there's only one right answer to this one. Uh, I'm hoping uh, both Phil and Kristen that, that this document, as you will recall, uh, it's the uh, it's the OCNI CNA Canadian decommissioning capabilities catalog directory, I guess is a better term that was released in December of 2020. And I hope that's been of some value to you in identifying uh, suppliers to meet your long term decommissioning goals. So I said there's only one right answer for this one, isn't there? <laughs> yes, it okay. is very Good. helpful. Thank you, Ron. Good. Um, you uh, Phil mentioned the uh, the decommissioning gap um, gaps, and, and um, I'm just want to follow up on 
What is your strategy to fill those gaps? Are we looking at partnerships with, let's say, experienced international firms that, that, that have those capabilities that then partner with Canadian companies so we then have Canadian capabilities over the longer term? Okay, uh, so so I, th I think I'm gonna have a go at answering that a little bit, Ron. So 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 looking at the gaps we've got there, and and you know looking looking at your document that you were just waving just a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what what I would say is when when we look at the Canadian marketplace at the moment, we we think we've got the majority of the answers at our doorstep. Um, that's the right answer. That 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 <laughs> that, that, that that's the truth of the matter. We, we've got some fantastically strong. Canadian businesses that cover a whole range of this. Yes, we do sometimes need to look uh, overseas for uh, you know a few uh, a, a few smaller items which are very specialist or where maybe there's some knowledge of things that have been done. But in terms of the actual capabilities, um, which you could see with that white shell project, there, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're they're Canadian born. They are so. So, so what we're really, really seeing in terms of making this happen is is working out, and that's why I say you know, there's no big one company that has all the answers to this. It comes from a variety of it, which is why the toolkit is not quite the same animal as our big construction delivery partnerships, where you know you can just bring a single consortium or a big organisation to bear. This is one where you know you, you've got some very, very strong Canadian businesses in automation and manufacturing. Uh, that have all all the things we need here, and all we need to do is hook up uh, and work together with various designers, uh, manufacturers, suppliers to bring those things together as, as as a solution, which we're already doing. And I think you know White Shell's a you know really good example of seeing that in in kind of the uh, you know retrievals and processing side of things. But but there's just so many other areas as well, Ron. I think when you when you look at the uh, the long term outlook, the the seven projects that were on uh, on Kristen's slide, and 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 there's probably more to come after that if you throw in, well, of course, Pickering and Gentilly too. So, but your projects alone, um, to the extent that we can use a lot of Canadian suppliers on those projects, sometimes in partnership with uh, offshore expertise. I think one of the things we learned. Uh, through the decommissioning document when we prepared this a year ago, that uh, the UK and the US may be somewhat ahead of us in decommissioning. They've, they've started earlier, but uh, but involving Canadian companies in your projects and in the in the Pickering project, it's a great opportunity for us to build that capability so that Canada can play a role not only in the large decommissioning market but a fairly substantial offshore market. So. Uh, I really uh, applaud what you're doing. Um, uh, another question you mentioned in your uh, uh, sustainability um, bees nest or beehive <laughs> that it looked like, <laughs> uh, a number of factors. And of course, a big one is uh, the encouragement of companies to use local suppliers and indigenous suppliers. Have you guys prepared or are you thinking of preparing a directory of local suppliers and indigenous suppliers that that uh, that you can share with companies so that if company X uh, wants to work on a cask facility or on your uh, uh, on your hall roads facility that they have they know how to contact uh, local companies to work with them. So that's, that's really that's a really great question Ron and and the answer to that is you know over over the last uh, couple of years, you know what what we've been doing, uh, and various various of our audience will have seen it today. We've been gathering bits of supply chain data effectively in terms of the companies that do do business with us um, through our registration process. You know we collect a, a you know a number of bits of information now about about those companies, um, and, and what I'd say is as of this immediate moment, we don't publish that. Do we have aspirations of publishing in that in the not too distant future? Ab absolutely, uh, and I think it's uh, it's uh, it's about creating that visibility. And I think it's a two it's a two way thing um, in terms of as I was saying earlier, 
um, you know, we're, we're trying to find ways of how we communicate opportunities downwards into the supply chain, either directly or, or through some of these big partnerships. Um, but it's equally important to, to know what's available and out there for us to use. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we really do encourage, you know, businesses that are interested. We still have our links. Again, we had a little issue on, on our portal uh, back at the last year in terms of those registration links, which we've now kind of resolved. So we're kind of but uh, back and set up for business really, Ron, in terms of, uh, you know, really wanting to see, you know, who, who's out there, what capabilities it's got, but also to, to, to know what type of businesses they come from, whether they are an, in, you know, an indigenous owned business or whether it's a local business, you know, we're wanting to characterize that and yeah, we can, we can absolutely move towards providing that visibility. Um, I am just about, or OCNI and I is just in the process of uh, commissioning uh, a new document, which I thought might have existed already, but it really doesn't. Uh, it's a document that, that's going to be called a roadmap to becoming nuclear qualified. And I think everybody has kind of talked about it, but it has never been written down in one place. And I think, uh, so I've, I've commissioned that uh, document by a cup, two of our member companies that are very experienced in nuclear qualifications. And I think it'll be very valuable for your local suppliers, as well as in the longer term suppliers in Alberta, Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, who want to participate in our SMR program because it's 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 known, but it has never been to my mind because I have explored captured in a nice succinct format. So you could give that to one of your local suppliers who maybe have maybe partly qualified. So it'll it'll show you depending on where you are. This is how you go from your current state to become a nuclear qualified supplier. Now, some of them may choose to partner with other companies, but some may wish to go on that journey on their own. So I think this will be a valuable tool, not only in the SMR program, which is going pan-Canadian, uh, but to what you guys are doing locally um, uh, around CNL. So um, that'll be, you know, maybe a couple of months down the line, but we'll keep you uh, keep you posted on that. Um, this Ron, if I can just jump in there for a moment, I mean, uh, you know, that 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 that's kind of great, great to hear, uh, and I think there's, um, you know, I, I think it is really important. I, I think for a long time we've recognised that, you know, doing work in the nuclear industry can be, uh, particularly for smaller businesses, somewhat intimidating. Yeah. You know, there, there are there are there 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 are certainly barriers. Uh, you know, from a from a safety and a quality point of view, there there are things that we have to do that you don't see in you know, say for example, day to day construction. So there is a further kind of uh, level we need to get to. So so help helping business un understand and get along the journey, I think, is going to be really helpful for that. You know, what we've also tried to encourage as well, and we've had a few successes with this, is to your point about, you know, there are certain companies that have been through the process, have got there, know what it takes to get there, who have been kind enough to do a bit of like the, the, the mental protege kind of approach yep, with yep. some other businesses. So, so again, we're really pleased where we see anything like that happening. And I, I think one of the biggest parts about the intimidation of what it takes to become nuclear qualified is that people don't understand it. Uh, and, you know, the unknown is always scarier than the known. Uh, that's why we have nightmares. <laughs> uh, but once it's known and well described and and uh, there are and we can identify people that you can work with and train. Uh, and you might be pleased to hear this, Phil, even though you did uh, lose the Euro Cup yesterday, the Brits are very well advanced in their fit for nuclear program, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, and so what, I, what we're trying to do is emulate a fit for nuclear here in Canada so that we can have a process to recruit, coach, train non-nuclear companies who want to enter uh, the SMR supply chain and the and the decommissioning supply chain, which are two big, big opportunities uh, locally. Um, I, here's another question, a little more specific. I've got a couple of more general questions, but we'll dig into a specific one for a moment. Uh, someone is asking if the suppliers for in situ grouting of the uh, NPD and white shell reactors have been chosen yet? Yeah, I can take that one, uh, Ron. So that's a great question. So the short answer is no. Uh, we went up on an expression of interest uh, specifically at the white shell uh, for WR1 reactor uh, not too long ago and got great interest from the supply chain. 
so that uh, we're still uh, working, planning to go out to the street on that with a RFP. Um, at NPD specifically, uh, later this fall, actually, we're planning to go out to engage with a grouting uh, consultant to help us, you know, start with the grout planning. We didn't want to do some okay. test pours and that. So there'll be some action on both those fronts uh, in the next six months as we move forward. So. Okay. I have a personal bias. This is my own question, a personal bias. Uh, being a, a, a proud Manitoban and Winnipegger, and remembering my very first job in nuclear was a summer student job at the White Shell Nuclear Laboratory when uh, the organic cooled reactor was just getting commissioned. I have a, still an interest in that. Uh, are there any thoughts of repurposing that site to, I mean, it's a beautiful site on the Winnipeg River. Uh, and you, I'm sure our, you've, you've worked with our friend uh, Blair Skinner, the mayor of Pinawa, who might even be on this call. Uh, are there any thoughts about what that site could be used for? including potentially an SMR? Yeah, I, I can uh, I, I can speak a little bit about this and, and Phil may want to jump in if he has anything to add, but absolutely. Um, there's been a lot of work done with uh, Blair Skinner and the local uh, community there about potentials to uh, revive, you know, reutilize the site. Um, you know, we do recognize that this is a, a major employer uh, for the local area and we are looking, working with the uh, local community in order to look at opportunities uh, to sustain that, to, to grow the economic development in the area. Um, so there, there is a, there's been a lot of effort towards that, right? Mm -hmm. As we, as we move closer to the end and, and Lou may actually uh, have, you know, a couple of things to add because there's a lot of stuff that's been done by CNEA to, uh, to support this as well. So maybe I'll pass it to Lou. Sure. Thanks. And uh, it's odd that your MC should be answering a question, but I'm happy to weigh in here and <laughs> the rules. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, Ron, it remains a closure project. That's what the contract is with the client. And we are just, you know, contractors. Uh, AECL owns the site. However, having said that, obviously, we've been working very hard with Blair. He's one of the hardest working local mayors and he understands the the impetus and, and the ramifications of this. You know, there are lots of folks uh, that, that are in the beautiful town of Pinawa and the surrounding area. So, you know, CNEA, the parent companies have been, uh, you know, have leaned in, partnered with Blair and uh, an organization called North Forge East to create and incubate small businesses there. So we continue to do everything we can to find uh, new economic opportunities. One of those you mentioned, obviously, is you know uh, our invitation process for citing an SMR invites vendors to look at all CNL managed sites, including White Shell. Starcor has expressed an interest uh, in this in the White Shell site, and they've been working very hard with the Manitoba government. <clears throat> pardon me to 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 you know progress that deal. So. Uh, it's still a closure project from a CNL point of view, but we're doing everything we can in partnering with Blair and the White Shell Regeneration Partnership, Wayne Owasco and the Manitoba government to find new economic uh, opportunities as well. Good, okay. Uh, I thought you'd turn on your camera, uh, Lou, because you wanted to uh, end this, but I, well, we can end it shortly. Uh, we will start to wrap down, but I do have uh, one more question. Um, uh, I think, uh, Kristen mentioned that the heavy water detritiation facility uh, will will detritiate uh, CNL's heavy water to a point where it could be classified as uh, pure heavy water. I don't like to use the other term. I've been told that's not a good term to use. Pure enough to be used in the medical application. And, and I, from my work in heavy water, and I did work in the heavy water area when I was at Ontario Hydro many years ago, we never believed that you could detritiate water for medical purposes. You had to use new heavy water for medical purposes. Has there been some, some developments now that you can actually get that heavy water to the point where you can generate some revenues from medical applications for CNL? Um, well, I, I'm going to take the first crack at this, uh, Ron, and then um, I'll have Phil or either Lou or, or uh, our VP of commercial uh, weigh in as well. Um, you know, so short answer is uh, yes. You know, with our technology and research that done, we we can uh, clean up the heavy water in such a fashion that it can be reutilized outside of the uh, nuclear industry. Um, so uh, yes, oh, okay. I, that that terminology uh, I you know that I used previously. Uh, 
shame on me. Uh, yeah, so that uh, we, we do uh, we do have technology that can that can do that. Um, and that's what uh, we you know, we're building into this uh, new facility such that we can clean up this material. Oh, um, you know, so I, I do know that, uh, you know, across Canada and elsewhere, this is, um, a, you know, a commercial opportunity to use outside of the nuclear industry. And, and you know, maybe I'll have uh, Lou share a little bit more about that as part of his role. Sure. I, as you can see, Ron, I wear multiple hats here. So I'm you putting do everything. A, Next time I'm going to see another shovel in your hand. Listen, I, I <laughs> that, that's a dangerous thing, but in, in, <laughs> Just a reminder, I think at the end of the day, you know, this is a, a cleanup program first and foremost to detritiate the water. After that, you know, when we have when we have the byproduct, what can we do with that byproduct? And this is a beautiful recyclable story, I, I, I think, you know, and that if you can take some waste and turn it in some to, to a commercial yeah. application. Yeah. My understanding is, you know, the, the semiconductor business and there are other uh, applications for this. So we are looking at that from a commercial perspective yes. down the road. But first and foremost, it's it's a it's a clean it's a clean up program. Great opportunity. You know, well, with that, I think uh, there's one person I, I, I should have thanked. Serena Harrison works closely with Lou and uh, in, in making these things happen. She's our manager of uh, stakeholder engagement. So I forgot to thank Serena for helping to organize this. Uh, Lou, Phil, Kristen, I want to thank you guys uh, and Phil Compass for putting on a great program. I mean, we're north of 350 people registered today. Uh, when when people are spending billions of dollars, I mean, you're going to have lots of friends. Uh, and I just want you to know that the OCNI supply chain is strong and vibrant. Uh, and I, they, I think you made the message very clear. Uh, they should be looking for local partners, looking for indigenous companies to be sustainable and score those sustainability points. Uh, in addition to, of course, meeting your quality requirements. Uh, and I think the other thing that, that we've also heard, not only from you guys, but also is you want to make sure that your suppliers are financially sustainable, that they're they're strong and robust and will be with you because decommissioning projects are going to last a long time. And you want to make sure that the supplier and the consortium, more importantly, has the broad resources, uh, human resources and financial resources to be with you guys in the long term, because this is not a short term business. So, I mean, with that, I'm going to thank thank you guys for an excellent, excellent uh, webinar this morning. Uh, we'll make the recording available. Uh, the presentations will be available. Um, and uh, so those are my, I'll just thank everybody. Do you have any final remarks, uh, Lou or Phil Compass, before we sign off this morning? Ron, on behalf of CNL, I just want to say thank you for the fantastic partnership with you folks. Also, a little reminder, this is on behalf of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, our client. Uh, so, you know, we thank them for obviously making uh, this available. Uh, and with that, Ron, we look forward to the next one and stay yep. tuned for future CNL Live events. Super. All right. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.